amazing. God speaks of himself in the Old Testament, obviously with masculine characteristics and female. Whenever there's comfort needed, he'll speak to us with female characteristics to bring us comfort. And you think of the family. There's a mom and a dad. And the dad is supposed to say things like, did you do that? And the little guy runs to mom and she says, what would you do, sweetheart? What is it? It's perfect. It's exactly how it's supposed to be. <laughs> Out of the effort of two who are one flesh, the Bible says, they raise up a child. And I know, can I say this? Can I take the liberty to say this? If not for many of us, all of us. All of us could say, I would have liked to have had a better parental upbringing. No kidding. I came from a dysfunctional home. Get in line. But isn't it interesting how much of your relationship with God you either have to enhance or back away from because you bring your relationship with your parents into your relationship with God and it can cloud, cloud up the waters. And you've got to deal with that. We all have to deal with that. It doesn't make the family wrong. Our generation rejects marriage, rejects family, as though it can get along without it. And it cites the example as being the reason. And listen, the example does, does not divorce us from the model. God invented it. Man destroys it. Remember that. Don't say a word right now. But what's your opinion of marriage? What, if it's negative, it's because you've got your eyes on destructive marriages or you're in one that it's ungodly. You might say, well, my my." experience with marriage is awesome. It's been fantastic. I talked to a pastor in Orange County, and we were talking about uh, the book Lisa and I wrote. And he said, man, I'm just loving this. And he said, it's, it's amazing. I kind of leaned a little bit more toward Lisa's side, he said, because I grew up in an amazing Christian home. And I said, well, you know, obviously you read the book. I did not on my side. She did. And he said, in fact, listen, and he talked, he goes, my mom and dad, I saw them praying on their knees every day of my life. My grandma and grandpa, I saw them praying all the time. I, my great grandpa, I got to see him a few times. All Christians, amazing people of God. I said, dude, you're amazing. Let me touch you. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. Did you know that if it was left up to God, that would be the norm? So you young people tonight, don't, don't divorce yourself from marriage or the concept of it because all you look around to see is failure. You keep your eyes on God, and God will transform or give you a great marriage. He made it. He doesn't make junk. We goof things up. The prodigal rejects authority. Without God as our authority, we will seek some form of authority. Isn't it weird? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So that's why Satan possesses it. Isn't it freaky weird? Satan gets inside of it. Eef. And he said to the woman, listen to this. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Sowing seeds of doubt, ladies and gentlemen. Mark that. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree of the uh, the, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. False doctrine. Number one, so doubt. Number two, false doctrine. Verse five, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, undermining authority. Knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw, see, she looks at it differently now, right? So when the woman saw, she takes another look at the tree, that it was good for food. That's the flesh. Now she's thinking, hmm, flesh. That it was pleasant to the eyes, hmm, lust. And a tree desirable to make one wise. Ooh, pride. She took of its fruit and ate. 
She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Wow. Rejecting authority. Listen, you cannot reject authority without getting in trouble. It's a law of God. You go out here and run around on the freeway, you're rejecting authority, you're going to get hurt. You go driving down the street 100 miles an hour, you're rejecting authority, you're going to get hurt. God says this is the way that it is, and we'll either acquiesce or submit to his authority or to our own. It's amazing. The the prodigal son had a problem with authority. Secondly, look at verses 13 and 14. The prodigal son makes the wrong decisions. This is the next manifestation. When once you begin to reject authority, you start making ridiculous decisions. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with extravagant, lavish, prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. Listen, famines come and go. They come from droughts. We're in one right now, right here. He should have been ready, but he wasn't. There arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So we asked this question, what is the child thinking about when he departs? Watch this. I can do it my way. I'm out of here. I'm rejecting your authority, and... I'm in the midst of making really stupid decisions. (laughs) And they launch out, and they're going to go cut a path for themselves, and they have no ability, they have no craft, they have no skills, they don't know anybody, and they wind up sleeping at their friend's house for a month, right? And then they can't, they, they get sick of him or her, and they wind up putting her out on the street, and then she's wandering or he's wandering around, and this stuff begins to unfold. And listen, this is a tough thing. Are you guys sitting down? Are you listening? This is tough. Imagine now, we're talking about a 20, 22, 25-year-old person, 18-year-old person. And you don't tell me what to do. And, and your friend's parents, you don't tell me what to do. And then, in, then they're fighting with their friends. And everything begins to fall apart. Does this sound familiar? Everything begins to de- deteriorate around them. And the first action for the parent is one most often they need to resist. There'll be a message on the phone. Mom, uh, this is Goober, (laughs) and um, I could sure use a couple of bucks, and uh, you know, kind of miss you, Dad. And then, Stop right there. Our emotions, as a parent, will go insane. You call the National Guard, you got the Marine Corps, the, the, the Air Force, everyone's hunting. You call the police, you gotta find my boy! And you start driving around town all night long. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you're looking and you're looking and you're looking and you're looking and you're looking. Listen, that's a mistake. You need to stay home and you need to pray. And you don't give them a dime. Did you hear what I said? You cannot give them a penny. That's one of the most heartless things I've ever heard. Not at all. To give them a penny would be the most heartless thing I've ever heard. Because you are perpetuating, A, you are perpetuating them in their sin. B, you are pushing them further away from God and from authority. C, they will never come to themselves or their senses if you let this continue. If you enable that, you will be an accomplice to their ultimate demise. Listen, parents, God didn't call us to be our kids' friends. Listen, you can have sex with somebody and create a baby. That's all you've done. That doesn't make you a parent. A parent studies and figures out who this kid is and what do I need to do to reach this kid. And by the way, how many kids do you have? It doesn't matter if you have one or if you have a hundred of them. It's this. Every one of them are different. Have you noticed that? Every one of them are absolutely different. See, but they came from the same place. It doesn't matter. Isn't that weird? You need to know your child specifically and deal with them and work with them and learn them. That's parenting. It's not creating a child. It's what you do after you have one. 
I just want a baby. I just want a baby. Borrow somebody's baby then for an hour. <laughs> Believe me, an hour and you're ready to give it back. Yeah, that'll heal you real quick. <laughs> Wrong decisions are made. And so he goes on this long journey, verse 13 tells us. And listen, there's something in his mind, in her mind. I can do this better. I can live my life better than what my parents have been telling me to do. By the way, there's something about distance that soothes a prodigal's conscience. Distance. They're far from home. They, 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 use, they, don't, usually go, <laughs> they don't usually run away from home and go two houses down. The more miles behind them, the, the more free they feel. This boy felt free. Woohoo! Spring break, I'm in Miami. Mom's dead are freezing to death in Ohio. And uh, you'll see your kid on YouTube or something, you know. <laughs> There's something about distance. Young, immature person might have some money. Mom and dad aren't there. And unless God is a stable, has a stable root and a stable foundation in their life, that's a scary thing. Uh, I'm probably going to get in huge trouble with what I'm about to say. But I believe our culture, by and large, in mass, has reached a state of immaturity and godlessness that many of our children are not equipped. At the age that they traditionally have gone to college and university, they're no longer able to go to college and university. Because number one, the professors will eat them alive. Number two, the godlessness is profuse. Number three, you're going to pay $50,000 a year for your kid to unlearn everything you put within them. I'm sorry to say this, but I meet with parents who are trying to pick up the pieces of their children's lives, and they had to pay the system to get them broken. It is a tragic time. There's something about distance that allows a prodigal to feel a little bit of soothing in their conscience. And this guy's living it up. He's sinning it up. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 5, only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. There's no perfect parents. Mom and dad tonight, you may be sitting here or listening or watching right now, and you're thinking, I did this, I created, I blew it. Listen, listen, God's grace is huge. There are no perfect parents, and you need to, listen, well, you know, he's, he's 25 years old, and he's just so messed up. There comes a point, no matter how messed up of a life we came out of, that if we turn to God, listen, God is God. He's on his throne. He's huge. He takes the worst lives and can fix them. If you are the worst parent to your child, your child still has access to God. And when your child says, I won't believe in God because you are a horrible parent. Just know this. I know this, go, I know this hurts you. But listen, you need to understand something. The Holy Spirit is alive. And he'll say, now son, listen, you've been blaming your mom and dad long enough. Yeah, they were real stinkers. They goofed up terribly. Deal with it. Because I'm God. Give your life to me and I'll take it and make it great. They hear the same Holy Spirit that you do. And in this parable, this boy is, first of all, full of himself and probably not hearing anything, making wrong decisions, one right after another, which leads us to verses 15 and 16. The prodigal son will eventually face the outcome. The music is going to be played. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and here it is, and no one gave him anything. That is a great thing. Let me, let me, allow me the liberty to change this for a second. Oh, and this was all terrible, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of the pigs, uh, that, that the pigs ate, and, and somebody was sneaking a burrito in between the fence there. What, what would that do? It would keep him longer with the pigs. It would keep him longer away from his family. Now something started to happen. Thank God he's having to face the outcome. Are you here tonight and you're, 
You might even be here tonight because you've been starting to face the outcome. Things aren't going well. This is falling apart. What's going on in my life? This is a good moment. Seems like everything I touch turns to dust. My life's ruined. Great. I mean it. I'm not being rude. Great. Come to the end of yourself and be free from yourself. I'm going to say this in light of this point here. The consequences are, it is a law of God. It, 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 is, it's not, it cannot be changed. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. reap. This goes for your kid. There comes a time when this begins to happen in a child's life. Parents, listen. You must control yourself and let your child suffer at this time. I know this sounds brutal. When someone's drowning, I don't know, uh, I, I've never seen this happen, I've read about it numerous times, but maybe you have too. When someone's drowning in the ocean or in the pool, a lifeguard, if the person is thrashing about and violent so the lifeguard doesn't drown, what does the lifeguard do? He does one of two things. He's got two options. The lifeguard either stays back and lets the guy drown, and then he rescues him and then revives him, or he'll punch him in the face and knock him out. Did you know that? Why? Because the person thrashing about finally has figured out, oh, I need help. And then they go into a panic. And if, if you deal with them like that, they'll kill both of you. They'll, he'll, he'll drown you. You'll both die. Suffering is not evil. Where do we get this in our minds? Suffering can be a great thing. If your child tonight is suffering because they were, they've been a prodigal, don't rush in with your checkbook. Don't rush in to alleviate. God is at work. God is moving, Mom. God's moving, Dad. Wait, be patient. Wait upon the Lord. Have you committed them to God? Yes, a thousand times. Then trust God. But he got arrested. Excellent. Trust God. I'm serious. I would rather have a child of mine be arrested and put in jail than to wind up being killed for drunk driving or whatever it might be. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The word train up, it's one word actually in Hebrew. It means make a narrow path. Listen to this. Oh man, is this totally like radical? Listen, you think our culture would adopt this? Listen to this. Make a narrow path, initiate or dedicate, or set straight course for your child. Steer them in the direction that you want them to go regarding what they regarding what you want them to become in body, soul, and spirit. That's brilliant. You ought to write that down. Train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart of it. Put them on a path straight, body, soul, and spirit. Parents are to instruct your children body, soul, and spirit. There's the answer right there, Proverbs 22.6. Um, per, this is personal, but this is exactly what it means. Our granddaughter's three and a half years of, of age. She said, everything is, Papa, Papa, you, you, be, you, know, you know who Angus is? Those of you who, you know Angus in the Disney cartoon? Okay. Anyway, Angus is a horse, and I have to be that horse. I'll put socks on my ears. And so, and she's, she's some princess. And then, you know, it changes, and then she's this, and I've got to be something else. And, and but here's the, it's amazing, because she'll say, okay, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, a, uh, I'm going to be a boy monkey. No, I'm the boy monkey. You're the girl monkey. No, I'm going to be the boy monkey. No, no, Papa's the boy monkey. You be the girl monkey. You're a girl. You be the girl monkey. I'm a boy. I'll be the boy monkey. Very biblically, Proverbs 22, 6, normal. You hear what I'm saying? You have to train a child that way. Our culture's in the situation that it is because, frankly, parents are not parenting. Our kids have been left to themselves. But when they suffer, listen, when, when little Bobby calls up and says, Dad, you know, I'm, 
man, I just a little, I think I think I might have a little bit too much to drink, and I I I hit this pole, and, and I, this is my phone call. The cops are calling me, and so son, I tell you what, what what are they saying? Well, they're gonna put me. I'm in jail right now, you know. Well, I'll be there in the morning. In the morning, I'm dead serious, you guys. I am dead serious. Have you ever been in the back of a cop car? I haven't. I'm just thinking maybe you have. <laughs> There's no cushions back there. I've been in jail before. I've been in prison. I've been in a federal prison. Maximum security. Scared the snot out of me. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was scared. Because when I went to go visit this guy, they put the same clothes on me that all the prisoners had. And I had a little name tag, a clipped eye. And I'm looking around, I'm in there. And I'm telling you, I was absolutely terrified. And I asked the guard, I said, listen, I got the same clothes, they, this thing clips on and off. I'm a little insecure about this. And the guy goes, have fun, you're in my house now. <laughs> I, do you know who you're talking to? He didn't care. <laughs> It's terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> this alarm keeps going off. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I know it's time's up, but man, that thing makes noise. The final thing, verses 17 to 19, is the prodigal son, thank God, repents of his deeds. He repents. This whole process leads to repentance. Verse 17, but when he came to himself... Those are great words. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough in, in that to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. Great news, eh? Huh? Wonderful, right? I will say to him, father, look, he's so cute. He's rehearsing this now. I'm repenting. I've had enough of this. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy. That is, verse 19 is key. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, this is a beautiful thing, this word make. He's not pushing himself around now. Watch this. It's remarkable. Get this. Make me like one of your hired servants. The term literally means I submit to your authority. Watch. I submit to your authority. He doesn't say make me like one of your servants. You want to know how repentful this boy is? I submit to your authority. Make me like one of your hired servants? Hired servants. You might say, well, you rotten kid, you want your dad to pay you? you uh, listen, the word is craftsman. Father, I've sinned against you. Will you put me on as one of your servant craftsmen? The craftsmen were paid for their work. The son is saying, I've lost it all. I've come, Father, back both repentful and to make restitution. I'm going to pay you back. Listen, never forget this. A truly repentful person comes back with no conditions. Don't ever forget. There's no other definition of true repentance apart from someone coming back with no conditions I'll move back in if. No. Ray Stedman, the great pastor who is now with Jesus, says perhaps the most hopeful sentence in this entire parable is the phrase with which this section is introduced, but when he came to himself. Years ago, I heard of a very eloquent preacher speaking on this parable. He was illustrating what happened to the prodigal son in the far country. He said... And I quote, as his money disappeared, he had to sell his coat in order to eat. Then he took off his shoes and sold those. Then he took off his shirt and sold that. Then he took off his pants and sold that. He sold everything until he came to himself. <laughs> He's naked broken. As we're out of time, I want to leave this with you. I'll just skip to the end, and here it is. I was shocked to discover this in preparing for this message. How many of you have ever heard, Come thou fount of every blessing? We've, we've sing it here. 
I did not know what I'm about to read you. A little over a hundred years ago, a man by the name of Robert Robertson was riding a stagecoach. Another passenger in the coach was humming a verse of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Then the first verse, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. She asked Robertson what he thought of the hymn. His answer was strange. He said, Madame, I am the poor unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. Robinson had been saved at the age of 19 through the preaching of George Whitfield. Later, he became a preacher himself, first as a Methodist preacher, then as a Baptist preacher, and then as a Unitarian preacher, which denomination denies the deity of Jesus Christ. He became a wandering, miserable, wayward soul. Robinson failed to heed the very words that he himself had penned so long ago in that third verse of song. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it for thy courts above. He was a prodigal. He ran from God. We're going to pray right now together in this solemn, holy moment, I believe. And no matter where you're at, you might need to rededicate your life to God here tonight. Father, we come to you, and Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would search our hearts, Jesus. Maybe we've lived for sex. Maybe we've lived for money. Maybe we've lived for uh, even things that we might justify as good, that we've lived for acceptance. We've lived for affection or meaning or purpose or value. We might even say, God, we, we lived for status or education. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to understand that being a prodigal does not mean that we necessarily fall into some gross sin. It could simply mean that we have been so proud enough to think that we can do it on our own. We can throw enough effort at it. We can throw enough finesse at it. We can throw enough technology at it. We can throw enough whatever at it and miss the very heart of God. 